My girl like, but pray heavily. Not the up on a cruise, worth to Penelope. Three females at my crib carried my legacy, so it's three Ks on my compound like white supremacy. Ooh, yeah, this high key a word. If your skin tone is black, then you high key deserve conversation. Yeah, widely dispersed across your turf onto every seat you birth. If you concur, then say ooh, yeah. This high key a word. Since my skin tone is black, then I high key deserve conversation. Yeah. Widely dispersed across my turf onto every seat I burn. It's young nail on the beach in the bars, though. Clean as bar soap, black as charcoal, tar roads, and cigar smoke with every bar spoke from my lips. Hope your eyelids allow your iris to see the flow is one with Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham, daddy. Come get your cake up, but don't take up all the space in the valley. You go for mountain tops as well. It's countless attacks from hell on those mounted on the back of the counselor who counted heads on your. High fade, low fade, no fade, box braids, crochets, can't really think of more ways to reassure you. They'll abhor you in public, but secretly adore you. Cause your aura couture, no matter who ignore you, or who pay attention, listen, you can bet your pension, you was born to glisten till the day you lay in stiff and pine. I know all skin folk ain't my kin folk, but the ones who are and ain't got no heart, wish I could dig inside and give you mine. Cause it's hard as hell for those I hear that's melanated. That's why my brother clapped for me like I just graduated. Do your research, don't just get your baby vaccinated. These demons want you acclimated and evacuated. Ooh, but if you understand, you shouldn't do no stressing. I believe in God, my squad, and my Smith and Wesson. If you try to touch my husband's son or my brethren, you'll have an arm over your head like you just asked the question. Ooh, yeah, that's high key a word. If your skin tone is black, then you high key deserve conversation. Yeah. Widely dispersed across your turf onto every seat you birth. If you concur, then say ooh, yeah. Just high key a word. Since my skin tone is black, then I high key deserve conversation. Yeah. Widely dispersed across my turf onto every seat I birth. Ooh, 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 ooh. Good morning, sunshine. Welcome to reality. I tried to wake you, but you were sleeping so peacefully in your fallacy. Quite casually, I got seven uncolonized names to explain my galaxy. I'm a galaxy, but for sure, you can call me your majesty. Some of y'all new blacks act so surprised. The 2020 took all them cataracts off your eyes. Now you got perfect vision. See clearly through the disguise. No need for pantomimes or alibis. The revolution is televised. This the year of discernment. Popping off, we burn it. You gon' pay everything you owe to Lil Riley said, cause I earned it. Perm tips with the new growth. Breaking out of that loose hole with the truth glow. Shining like new money, I got the new toe. So you gon' have to pick sides with the... Think you might be muted, DP. I'm so sorry I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you, John. <laughs> peace, 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 okay. everybody. It is the guy with the bow tie checking in with you live for another edition of Business of Benefits. To my white, right, you will have the amazing John Graham. How you doing, King? I'm well, sir. <laughs> I'm well. I'm well. Good to see you again, man. Yeah. I, I gotta step my bow tie game up. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it is all good. You got the intellectual game going. I had to kick us up with some Toby to have some uh, some great black music to start this conversation. And I want to say thank you to hashtag team live, hashtag team replay, how we consume the content. We appreciate it. Please let us know in the comments below where you are and how you're watching it. And also thank you on YouTube if you're watching us. Thank you on LinkedIn and also our sponsor StreamYard for sponsoring the show. So um, John and I met each other through LinkedIn. I've seen you in different circles. We have similar connections. And you've been on Professionally Black as well. And um, you got a book coming out. And so you got to get you on here for the book. So for the people that yes. don't know you are and the intelligence you bring to the platform, tell them what you do. Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is John Graham. I, uh, I am a uh, employer brand and diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, and marginalized lived experience consultant. Um, Today, uh, we're talking about uh, a book that is coming out that I think is uh, critical uh, for Black professionals and any professional in the DEI space. So happy to be with you. Boom. He's being humble right now, but we'll get into it real quick. <laughs> but um, it's, it's interesting because the Black professional faces kind of different things here. So you, you've been on Professionally Black, and I've created that kind of platform and series here on LinkedIn to give us a space to talk about the experience of being a Black professional in a positive way. 
in not so much a negative way. So um, what got you into the work you're in right now? Yeah, well, being a black professional was helpful, uh, you know, and honestly, just the, the lived experience on a day to day basis, you start to see consistencies and, um, you know, continuity between the experience of people that you work with, the people that you know at other companies or your family members and you hear these things. And so for me, like um, I, I sort of moved into this DE&I space as a result of building global employer brands where my job was to package and sell the culture of a company to attract talent, engage and retain talent as well. And I mm -hmm. always added um, a honest and human uh, rendering of the employee experience, whichever facet was being told, whether it was black, Latinx, women in leadership, LGBTQIA+, whatever, um, I embedded that into uh, the marketing and the branding because what I didn't want to do was sell a false narrative, right? And tell people, mm -hmm. hey, come to this company. It's great, phenomenal. We love DNI. and then they get there and the experience doesn't match. And so your marketing and your reality aren't in sync. And so um, I, I saw that there was an opportunity. In fact, I, I sort of projected that the future of DNI and employer brand is that they merge rather than be decoupled. And so uh, okay. I found myself with the opportunity to be able to explore that by helping companies actually build diverse and inclusive employer brands so that the marketing actually matches reality. That's definitely important because you're going to spend more time at work than you do at home sometimes. So it's definitely important for the culture to match up. And um, right. the book, Plantation Theory, great title off the bat, um, <laughs> definitely polarizing, catching people's attention. So what is Plantation yeah. Theory? Yes. So um, I guess as a bit of background before I explain Plantation Theory, I went to the oldest uh, degree granting uh, historically black college or university, Lincoln University. Um, where I majored in African studies. So between the ages of 18 and 22, I was immersed in a field of study that examined the contributions of Africans and African-Americans pre-slavery, pre uh, post-slavery and beyond. And so in my formative years, I saw the world in a way that most people don't get to because of our deficient histo history education as Americans, right? And mm -hmm. I, I would dare say even globally, history is not told. Uh, at, at the extent it should be. So um, I've always applied that lens um, to the work that I do. Um, plantation theory, as, a, as it's stated, is based on the fact that in 1866, four and a half million Black uh, Americans were freed, <clears throat> uh, pardon me, um, but within the first year, a quarter of that four and a half million died due to starvation and disease and neglect several you know a, a handful let's say out of that four and a half million migrated elsewhere set up and established themselves and went on to live free lives but then the majority of those people returned back to plantations uh, as sharecroppers and what would become this evolved form of slavery mm -hmm. and so uh, you know when you release people into a freedom state having never been freed for uh, hundreds of years they don't have the tools the education the means to sustain uh, a living, feed themselves, shelter, and so forth. So the natural inclination is to flee back to what they know and what mm -hmm. was secure. So they fled back to security in the face of freedom and all of the, uh, you know, uh, the elements that were up against them, right? Now being put into society to compete with the very people who, you know, just days ago literally called you their property. Um, yeah. So so you fast forward that, how does this element still exist today with plantation theory and connecting the dots between history and modern day reality? A lot of people don't understand that the modern day corporation is the evolved plantation, right? Mm, um, it's yeah. still based on the underpinnings of colonial labor, right? Low cost labor, high output and, and profit and productivity. Um, and so when you look at the stats and the metrics and black folks are still the most marginalized by uh, damn near every metric you can think about. And we've made regressive steps as black professionals. Uh, but even in particular, the pay, pay gap, pay equity gap, uh, black folks are paid 57 cents on the dollar to their white counterparts, which is mm -hmm. almost at parity at where we were in 1955. And so you had, you know, 
you had moments of progress where I think in the 70s and 80s, we reached maybe 77 cents on the dollar, but it was never fully equal. And so there was no, there, there wasn't a parity there. And so there's other there's other metrics by which we would consider ourselves marginalized, but these are the things that we go through on a daily basis: the the engagements, the interactions, the slights, the microaggressions, macroaggressions, um, the over credentialed but under considered, right? All of these things that we mm. deal with uh, that uh, are based on a, uh, a you know hundreds year old model. Mm, I'm gonna let that breathe for a second. I gotta let that breathe. I take that in for a second while I check in with the audience real quick. We have Cicely representing Arizona. Oh, she meant Team Live. Okay, Team Live. Thanks, Cicely, for jumping in here. We have Wendy representing from Florida. Great ally, abolitionist. Thank you for supporting. We have Robert Berry. Talked to him earlier today. Thanks for jumping in, Robert, for joining us, King. Then we have Diana Parker, also in Florida. Florida in the house today. Hey, Florida. <laughs> we got Winter Wheeler representing an ATO Team Live and Bonnie up in New York, all over the map today. So there's something interesting you put in the um, the preface of the book, the uh, the contract. <laughs> this part, people kind of commented like, what's the contract? And what, what's that all about? So you put there's a contract that Black right. professionals sign knowingly or unknowingly. So what is the contract we're going into? Yeah. Well, the, the contract is the premise, right? It's what we've been sold. Um, it is go to school, uh, elevate your station through education, um, you know, uh, graduate, get a good job, good corporate job, uh, or a good job, work for 30 years and retire, right? The American dream. <clears throat> well, the contract, unfortunately, doesn't, you know, in the fine print, doesn't tell you that this dream was never built for you. Um, the, the trade-off that we're looking at here is, um, when you enter these, these, uh, these environments, there are things that you're going to experience that if nobody preps you for can be devastating, mm -hmm. right? There's a, there's an emotional toll that comes along with having to don the mask on a daily basis. And we can talk about that, uh, if you want to and get into code switching and, de-otherizing oneself uh, mm -hmm. to be accepted and acceptable. Um, and so that contract, uh, you know, most people don't read the fine print. They don't know the fine print or they aren't told until they get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so my, my intent in this book was to give perspective uh, to uh, matriculating seniors and, and recent grads who are who have an opportunity right now to make a decision. Yeah? You don't have to sign the contract. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I'm not in any way, say, any way, shape, or form saying that people should flee or, you know, uh, not go into corporate scenarios because I think that there's uh, there's some things that you should be able to consider before you make that decision. Right. Uh, but go in with your eyes open, right, uh, and understand full well what you're what you're signing on for. Yeah. So you want to equip them because I mean, applied knowledge is really power, and if you know what you're getting into a corporate, it can be a good situation. But most people don't know. And when you mentioned the over credentialing and under considered, that's probably one of the biggest things, especially black women face, that they're very qualified. They have the most education out of any, you know, race and gender right now, it seems. And um, right. they don't they don't get considered. So I mean, that would be something for them to be prepared. Like, hey, if you're gonna go into this, understand mm -hmm. you might not get considered just because of your skin color and your, your gender. Just be prepared. You can do it and get the company car and the credit card and all that stuff, but just understand mentally you might take some fatigue to that. So um, yeah. there's there's exactly. a positive to that. I want to make sure people get that, that this isn't all negative. When you say plantation theory, it's not all bad. It's actually very good. Yeah, I, I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right, right? There, I often tell people that you should look at it if you're going to make the decision to go into corporate. Um, look at this as the next uh, level of your education, right? This is your opportunity mm -hmm. to understand how businesses work. What are the mechanisms, the relationships, the interplay between HR and sales and uh, marketing or supply chain and IT. I right? understand how all of these things function, but be leveraging this education to apply to your own venture. Whether you do that in tandem or if you do that on your own as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. but you know, um, don't miss out on the opportunity. In fact, you know, a lot of times we see that as the end, right? Uh, getting to mm -hmm getting to the to the corporate job and a good corporate job and then you know 
hopefully through this notion of meritocracy will be tapped for advancement. Right. <laughs> which, which meritocracy does not exist for black folks. That is a fact. Um, and so, you know, it's this, uh, again, going back to the contract, it's, it's this notion that, um, that that is the own, that that is the goal, right? To get mm -hmm. to the corporate job and not necessarily understanding that there's other options. Yeah, I'm glad you're saying that. Cause I remember my upbringing was always I'm a military kid and it was go to school, get a scholarship, check, check, and then get a good job. And that's where the check got thrown off for me. Um, it wasn't the right path, wasn't showing up for me. Like I have an accounting degree. Accountants don't make well unless you do it a long time. I did a different path. And my always teaching was to do that. Like go to school, you'll make it, you'll be fine. And I think it's interesting you point that out because I remember watching a documentary about um, whitewashing with white people talking about this. And a gentleman got up there and said, hey, I was working in a factory. I was probably the worst guy there. It wasn't any good. And then there's four supervisors that were Caucasian. And they said, hey, we see you as manager one day. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm like the worst here. I should be getting fired. Like he's thinking this is the talk about I'm about to get fired. But okay. because he was a white male amongst a sea of black men, they were like, oh, he's manager material. So that doesn't exist for us. We don't usually have that tap on the shoulder, <laughs> as mm -hmm. you mentioned it, that made that happen. So as people right. go into this, there are different ways. You can say there's one corporate path, but there's also the entrepreneur path. I want to make sure it's important to kind of clear that because some people think we see these entrepreneur conversations all the time that everybody needs to be an entrepreneur. But kind of share why you think the corporate structure can benefit some people as long as they understand what they're getting into. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think you're right. Not everybody is um, suited for entrepreneurialism and not because they're incapable, but, but because it's not taught. And if you think yeah. about it, our K through 12 education system doesn't teach people to be independent entrepreneurs and really, you know, master and con control their own destiny and outcomes. It's actually designed based on, again, the industrial labor model from the 1800s um, to build employees in mass. Right. You need a strong labor force for a broader, for, a, you know, uh, a thriving economy. Now, there are elite schools, uh, depending on your level of wealth and access, um, that, that go beyond that and teach people how to lead companies and, and sort of create these conditions for a leader ownership mindset. Uh, but that is not the, the, the masses. Um, Corporate can be a great learning opportunity for you to understand how um, people work in an organizational function or organizational fashion. There are a lot of dynamics, um, you know, and people bring their their personal lives into these, you know, into these environments. They bring their upbringings, their traumas, mm -hmm. their worldviews um, into these spaces where we're supposed to, you know, uh, magically coalesce into one purpose and mission for a broader organization. If you can understand how those things work and how to navigate those spaces and understand how what motivates people to you know, give their all towards a common purpose, then you can apply these things uh, to your own endeavor. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a much bigger conversation, and and it's and it's not necessarily just how do you master the game of corporate because my intent in this book was not necessarily that. Yeah, it was really to identify things that are hidden to most people, um, mm -hmm. which largely is the black lived experience. Uh, and we oh, started yeah. to get people, you know, sharing and showcasing that in these courageous conversations and open dialogue forums in corporate post George Floyd's murder. Yeah, but that was just the tip of the iceberg, right? Like people had those conversations and then would go to their next meeting and be isolated, be the only one in the meeting. Or, mm -hmm. you know, go to the next meeting after a courageous conversation and have somebody steal their idea. <laughs> right. So so there's these there's this notion of hearing our experiences versus actually addressing them. And so I wanted mm -hmm. to give, um, you know, I tell people in the, in, in the preface that this isn't a solutions book. Right. But it is designed to encourage you to ask better questions. Yeah. So. That's important. I mean, that's that's when positive to the pandemic and the George Floyd murder was that these conversations came up more frequently. And um, it's, it's interesting to see the unraveling as people kind of learn, because obviously a lot of history isn't taught very well. And um, black people don't know, it, but also Caucasian people don't know as well. Um, some of these things we're going through, we're learning together, but we've mm -hmm. kind of seen projections of it or little hints of certain things. 
But I mean, I've talked to black people that didn't know about Black Wall Street, even to this day. And it's the things you would think that oh, everybody knows about that. But we all have their own little bubbles. So would you say that's kind of common when you go into the corporate world is that the bubble has been so intensified that nobody knows really what's going on outside of it? I think that the bubble, let me say this. I think that people's objective is to, and I'll say largely, I'm not going to say this is for everyone, but a lot of times yeah. people's objective is to go in, do amazing work that they feel fulfilled by uh, with the intent of being recognized for that. Now, whether that's promotion or elevation or increase in pay, whatever the case may be, that's typically the premise. Mm -hmm. Things that get in the way, uh, particularly for Black people, is that we don't understand and, and aren't made privy to, again, through lack of exposure, to what the game actually is. There's there's a different game being played, right? Yeah. We, we're, we're showing up playing what we think is chess, but really it's squash, <laughs> right? Right. And so, and so, when I what I what I mean by that is, for instance, I, I think anybody in, in the audience today can can identify a person who was in the office who most people would call mediocre, um, but they were in a leadership position, right? They knew that there were people who were more qualified to be in that role, um, and couldn't understand why this person was in leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, what you may not have known is that person was uh, coming from a pedigreed school that was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was attended by their leader. Um, yep. They were brought in with a very specific career track in mind. And so this role was only they were only going to be in it for maybe two to three years max before they were moved on to a next next role on a development track, specifically mm -hmm. to rise to higher executive leadership. So we we're sitting here thinking, well. If it's about credentials, I'm I'm crushing it. I'm killing it. I'm getting these right. performance reviews, top of the top of the rank, blah blah blah. You know, chairman circle, executive recognition. But that's not the game, right? Yeah. The game because what you end up doing is you is you position yourself to be an excellent worker, right? Great laborer. And why would we remove that? Because you're you're keeping the machine going. Right. And so there's this mindset at the middle layer, like, why would I elevate or remove or, re or, or have to replace somebody who's knocking it out of the park, making me look amazing and I don't have to lift a finger? These yeah. are still these are still mindsets of a colonial model. But that goes back to plantation. Like you mentioned, you wouldn't take your strongest worker out the plantation and say, OK, you tend to the house. <laughs> no, That's you're exactly going right. to you're going to stay in the field because you're the best one in the field. Why would I move you out of that? But I think it's exposure is what's good about this information you're putting out there. If you're exposed to it, most of the things in the black community we're behind on, we weren't exposed to. Um, we help people build wealth versus building wealth. So we don't know that mm. game. We didn't know mm -hmm. leadership. We help leadership. So we don't know that game. So as you kind of go through this evolution for people, you mentioned in the book a part about you can't out hire bad culture. Um, That's right. You're just putting more bodies in there. And I think about that with all these uh, DEI people kind of coming up to leadership. He promoted somebody to leadership and DEI. And I'm worried about when the, the mirrors and smoke go away and it's not just a role, like you're just sitting there doing nothing. So um, talk to people about that, about that. People just try to hire more people in versus changing the behavior of the people. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. I, I truly believe that we have to get past this notion of trying to out hire bad cultures. And what I mean is adding more bodies to a burning building doesn't put out fires, right? It only mm -hmm. adds more fuel. And so if you're looking at um, the wave of recruitment, attraction, and talent acquisition is to bum rush these Black organizations, whether it's HBCUs, associations, Black job boards, um, so as to bring in uh, this talent and increase the numbers from a representation perspective. But what's happening is after a year, you're starting to see a mass exodus uh, across many sectors of Black folks who um, who just aren't seeing the the change or the commitment being lived out in their daily uh, their daily experience. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm I, I help companies push past that performative and diversity theater to really look at DEI and flip the model on its head and say, why are we working from this top down model of you know, leadership's, you know, com concern or, uh, you know, uh, wanting to see change is expected to trickle down to, yeah. you know, the most marginalized people in the organization. 
Um, and we know through economic theory, trickle down doesn't work. So, right. so at what point do we not flip this on its head and work backward from the daily lived experience of marginalized people and say, let's address these gaps uh, that mm -hmm. we're seeing. In fact, um, to, to get at this, I developed a, uh, a survey instrument called a lived experience survey that will help companies actually uh, measure the daily lived experience of marginalized people and then call out very clearly what the red flags are so you can shift your DEI strategy to address those experience gaps or those culture gaps. And it produces a score. So every year your goal is to you know, improve that score for lived experience, which then signals to marginalized groups that not only does this company hear me, they're taking action and they're, they're putting um, programming against this to measurably change what I experience on a daily basis, not just these compliance activities that check the box. Well, I, I like that you're doing that because a lot of these there's there's things out there that have been around for measuring these things, but they're not revisited. Um, we have mm -hmm. old models of systems that we just keep in place that like, this is the way we always do it. And it makes me think about how people kind of like bash the, the idea of Marxism. The old definition to me of Marxism could be kind of negative. But when you look at um, letting the workers get more power, if they just reconstruct these things to modern day and age, they're not as bad as they sound, but we kind of have this issue, I feel like, with Americans especially. We hold on to history of one piece and not really look at how does this apply to present day and redo the model? Because that's really what's happening is the workforce has a new model. This culture has a new model. We need to kind of redo things. And as these co companies are changing, what are some measurable things you've seen from trying to help improve the lived experience of the employees? Well, you brought up a good point, right? I, I don't think that, um, let, me, let me rephrase, companies have largely been monocultural, right? Mm -hmm. When you say corporate culture, if, when I say that word, what comes to mind? Is Working it, all day. <laughs> yeah, so maybe experience, but if you, what, what I ask people is if you had to describe your, if you had to personify your company, what would they look like? If they were a persona, mm -hmm. what would your company look like as a person? Yeah. Most times it defaults to a cisgendered white male because that's who yep. leads these companies, right? And so if they say culture starts at the top, then if, unless you're working for a for a Black-owned company or a Latinx-owned company or an Asian-owned company, then you are working for a white male company mm -hmm. as a culture. So that monocultural expectation, right, that, that you're coming in and assimilating to this culture um, but we're saying we want to embrace and celebrate your diversity. Well, here's the challenge, DEI, and I'll answer your question in a second, a uh, long-winded way to answer the question, but DEI still centers on this concept of diversity, meaning other than cisgendered white male, equity, meaning cisgendered white men giving something up, and inclusion, meaning cisgendered white men accepting you, right? Now, in that context, if we're going to work from that as the framing, then everything we do is still going to center whiteness. And we're not getting to the point where we're still, where we're, where we're really acknowledging what it is that marginalized people go through. What is their cultural, uh, what is the nuance that we're not recognizing and understanding so that we can truly embrace and celebrate. So when you start to say, you know, when you ask the question, what are the measurable successes? Well, that defines, all, that depends on what you define as success. And so when I ask the question, if all of this work gets funded, if you're, you know, you're, you're resourced, you have the right people in place, roles, responsibilities, and, and measurements are in place, who are the intended beneficiaries of the work? Mm -hmm. A lot of times when I ask that question, I get crickets, <laughs> right? And, th and then somebody will be like, well, everybody, to which I'll say, mm, everybody's not <laughs> marginalized. So... So if we're, if, we're, if, if we're talking about measurable success, I think we first have to ask a better question. Who are the intended beneficiaries? Mm -hmm. If it's a DEI as a compliance measure, then the beneficiary is the company, not the individuals, not the employees. Mm -hmm. But if it's DEI as a lived experience improvement activity, then the centered beneficiaries are those marginalized people or people who are experiencing inequ inequities. So that's that's really what I'm trying to push for. I can't say that anybody's knocking it out of the park. And unfortunately, you know, I see these job descriptions out there for DNI leaders, and they want you know 20 years of experience and best practice <laughs> thought leader and da da da. I'm like, but you, but this is a 57 year old practice in an eight billion dollar consulting industry that nobody's provided a solution for yet. 
Like nobody yeah. solved DNI. There is no company that can successfully say we did it. Yeah, and I think this performative, like you said, even if they try to, it's more for the shareholder for the press release. The hey, we got a, we did a one day training. Hey, we had somebody do this course for a few weeks. Like, and there's never any kind of change. But Box all check. of this yeah. goes to the whole company. I mean, if everybody's equal, it kind of makes the algorithm experience better. So it, it makes me think when people are like, "Why are we always talking about black stuff all the time? Why is it always going to be a black 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 people?" Well, because yeah. we haven't had the same focus until now. And honestly, the issues that affect us, we've seen spill over to the Asian community. Um, we've been dealing with hate for a long time in the black community and mm. on a grand scale, but we almost kind of got numb to it. We're like normal, like, mm. oh, that just, that happens to us. But then they hope it happens to black people. I mean, the Asian people, and now it's kind of like, wait a minute, this happens to other people? Well, yeah, it has been, but I, I think this is good work you're doing because even just shaking people with saying plantation theory, just that title yeah. shakes my like, that's still a thing. Why is that still a thing? So if you had to think about younger John going through yeah. college, and obviously you had upbringing at an HBCU, but talk about like in high school, what this would have done for you if you would have had kind of been exposed to this information in high school. <sighs> wow. Um, well, I think back to high school, and I, I, I went to high school in uh, the East Bay uh, of San Francisco. So, um, you know, San Ramon, uh, East Bay. So it's I, I was one of... I want to say maybe eight black students out of eight to 900. Mm -hmm. And so in a predominantly white uh, school environment, um, the only source of culture that I had were, you know, my black friends and my parents and my family. Right. And so mm -hmm. I got, I got that reinforced, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, uh, structured in, in, in academics for me. I think if I would have understood these things, there's, well, there's a certain level of maturity that comes with this information. As I mm -hmm. stated, I, I had this information between the ages of 18 to, to, to 22 in, in college. But even then, it's, it, it's the application of theory that becomes power, like you said. So until you're able to get into a scenario and really navigate these things that you're learning about in books and that you're hearing about from family, there's a disconnect. Yeah. Um, but I think the exposure to it, God, who knows what could happen if if history were taught through an honest lens uh, from K yes. through 12. You know, mm -hmm. that 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 is where the structure starts to starts to shake. Right. And starts to become reshaped because now we're we're operating in honesty. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you're educating, it's based on a model that continues to support the structure that is. Mm -hmm. so, I, yeah, I, I think that's that makes us all better as a people. Yeah, because oh. you and I were talking offline about how the uh, Texas Congress, the gentleman mm -hmm. didn't know that purity of the ballot was basically about keeping black people away from voting, but um, sure. he didn't know that. And I, I feel like if we expose this information sooner, it allows us to all be better to each other. Because if you know my experience from just a textbook, at least, um, I have to sometimes look at my kids when they're learning about, you know, Native Americans, and it's like barely in the textbook. Like they were here first, really? Like it's, it's things that we have to kind of correct them. Like you're learning in school, they have to teach you certain things because it's on a test. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, this is what's really going on. I'll show you something. And right. I think if I would have had that, I didn't learn about Juneteenth till I was probably in my late twenties, early thirties. Um, right. And th thinking about that pride of that, and people are like, y'all just learned about this. So I want people to know that when, when John's putting this book together, exposure is key. It's sometimes exhausting to have to be somebody else's history teacher. <laughs> um, I'll push sometimes and do it for people, but at the end of the day, finding these pieces of information helps expose you to just like if you go to another country or go to a restaurant you've never been to before, that exposure does round you out as a person. Um, mm -hmm. So what would you say to the, you know, if there's a corporation um, that's basically trying to get the theater of DEI, um, does that hurt them or help them just even having the theater of DEI for their company? Yeah. Well, uh, that's a really good question. And let me just acknowledge that a lot of companies are still not clear on what to do beyond a certain point. Right? There's a point where you can do all of the stuff that's, you know, sort of uh, stopping the bleeding, uh, as it were, <laughs> slowing it. But then once you get it under control, then what? Right. Because, mm -hmm. again, it, it, it would require you. It would require you to go past this uh, compliance mindset. 
So um, I think you have to start somewhere first and foremost, get it, get it going. But once you're, once you're ready to really dig in, um, you have to start focusing on lived experience. You know, there's, uh, there's uh, a, a layer of complexity even within what I'm about to say. Um, DEI is still very much a, like I said, a compliance activity. What what that's what that really means is there's there's legal risk to doing certain things or acknowledging certain things. Mm -hmm. Anybody in 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 employment law or HR legal uh, or general counsel will tell you that there's certain things that you you know as their job is to mitigate risk. There's certain things that just increase that risk or perceived risk um, to a company. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so if we're talking about, you know, going past performative, I would say it's first and foremost, you have to acknowledge uh, what you don't know. And then yeah. once you know it, you have to work on unlearning it and deconstructing within yourself. This goes well beyond just corporations as a shell. Corporations are nothing more than a, a gathering of people, you know, working towards, uh, you know, supposedly a singular mission. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we're getting into how do people deconstruct the layers of encoded bias, um, uh, language techniques and tactics that they've known since they were children and reinforced by family members. So when they get into these places with diverse ethnicity groups and they're using what they've known, but not yep. knowing how harmful it is, you're, you're essentially telling, you know, educating a fish about water. Right? Like, how, how do you explain water to a fish? It just right. is, right? And so now, mm. unless there's contrast, right, um, and they have an opportunity to to get, you know, a mirror in front. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I went on a tangent uh, by answering the question, but I think starting first and foremost with understanding where you are, recognizing that um, there are real people on the end of this work, and the focus right. should ultimately be on improving their lived experience because it can hurt a company mm -hmm. in the way of not only attrition rates, right? So it costs more to hire somebody than it does to retain them. And secondly, uh, it can do irreparable harm to your employer brand, right? Yep. What we know is if I'm experiencing, uh, if I'm having a negative experience with an employer, uh, and I won't even say an employer, if I have a bad manager, because people don't leave good companies, they leave bad managers. The manager, yeah. If I'm having a negative experience, I'm certainly not going to tell Daryl, you got to come join this company, man. It's amazing. <laughs> right? I'm not going to lie to you and bring you here. But conversely, if I'm having a tremendous experience and I feel valued and I see the work that I do has an impact and it's recognized and I'm elevated and there's a mm -hmm. development track and I have access and opportunity and proximity to advancement, then I'm going to tell everybody I know they got to join. So why not? Why not try to work on making your marginalized experience so good that they invite their friends, colleagues, uh, you know, and people who are super qualified to add to your culture rather mm -hmm. than trying to just go out and add new people who don't know who you are yet? Yeah. I mean, we think of you speaking about um, you can't unknow something. I think you and I share in common a love for hip hop music, uh, both been That's artists right. before, both vegan yes. and being vegan yes. for me was like I couldn't unknow what I knew. Like my wife started showing me videos, like, hey, look at this. And the, and the <laughs> one that got me was showing a farm. Like, here's Dave at the farm, and here's the mm -hmm. bacon, and that mental disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> that was what did it for me. It was like it's like, this is your dog, he's a pet. Why isn't he food? And it's like, oh god. So you can't unknow those things. <laughs> and um right. it's the same for DE. I mean, when seeing George Floyd was one of those unknowing moments when people say, No, black people don't have stuff like that happen to them, people don't get not you know promote it because of their skin color and when you see it you can't unknow it unless you create this cognitive dissonance where you're trying to fight yourself but i think that's the moment we're in right now that is like everybody sees it and we see people kind of crumbling sometimes the public settings falling apart over we don't need to talk about this history can we not talk about this but i really feel like it's a big awakening because you can't unknow it and if you do unknow it it's kind of something wrong with you i feel like if you just unknow something that was you found out was bad you're in a leadership position, you're trying to grow your company, and you hear all these things about your staff, you can't really unknow that. But have you seen examples of companies just trying to ignore it and then it just comes smacking them in the face? 
Um, I, yes. Uh, what I'll say is, you won't name any companies though. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. No. What What I'll say is, I, I've known that there are companies who have line item budgets to pay out discrimination lawsuits because they know that they're so prevalent within their company. <laughs> I wish That's I were sad. joking. I wish I were joking. Yeah. But what that tells you is that they are comfortable with the cost of lawsuit discriminations because, in ratio to their annual revenue doesn't it doesn't even it's a blip it doesn't it's even cheaper show to go to court than to fix the problem yeah and and the sad part about that is if you get into a a room of a hundred plus black professionals and you ask them has anybody had to file suit against their employer for discrimination and take it to an eeoc uh litigation and gotten a payout and then gotten the nda and they can't talk about it like 90 percent of the hands will go up because it's that <laughs> right. prevalent Right. And, and it, it's 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 sad. So, yes, there are companies who know they could be doing better and and don't, you know, and choose not to. Will I say that is not the majority? Absolutely. There's there's more companies who are actively trying to do something, uh, whether it's, you know, with the intent of just creating a good PR story or they are genuinely interested in, in sustainable change. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that that will be seen, you know, over time. Uh, as of a year post sort of the, the, the racial awakening of 2020 in a post George Floyd era, I will mm. say that um, now now people are being tested. Whatever those commitments were a year ago uh, yeah. are being tested. You know, are you living up to the commitment? And I dare say we're not there yet. Yeah, but we have, there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Yeah, but that's why you, you said the book isn't a, a book. It's not a how-to book. It's kind of a you know introducing you to. So what do you want somebody when they pick up the book? Comes out June nineteenth. Um, so I know people already asked me, is the book already out? I know John's just a heck of a marketer or a heck of a promoter, so it's not out yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you made Amazon's hot release list though. I think currently, right? We did. Yeah, yeah. So number one uh, in paperback and and hardcover. Uh, for their uh, new hot releases uh, list. So I'm grateful. What I can say is it's it's a testament to how necessary a book like this is right now for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. honestly, what I what I found was that on LinkedIn and, and Daryl, you, you, you and I, you know, connect with each other often on LinkedIn and you see some of the posts I do in the mm -hmm. comments so many times over the course of the past year, people would say things like, you know, this I've been thinking this for so long, but didn't <laughs> feel I could say it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think your platform uh, that you provided gives people that opportunity to finally say some of the things that we historically have been scared to say. Mm -hmm. So, if anything, coming out of this, I think um, you know people will black professionals will be able to see their story, and and, and we give voice to it. Uh, we honor it. We let them know they're not crazy. Um, and then, you know, allies and abolitionists will be able to get a, a really good perspective on what we go through so that they can position themselves to, to intervene, right? Yeah. Um, I encourage allies to matriculate to abolitionism because then you're putting something at risk to see this change happen mm -hmm. rather than comfortably sitting back and saying, ah, I'm not going to, you know, I, I, I'm not going to get involved when it, when it becomes too hard or, or yeah. it's, you know. Or it's a, or it's a risk to myself. So that that is what I what I uh, intend for the reader, right? The the audiences uh, for those who want to understand better the black experience in corporate spaces, and for those who are in positions of power to improve the lived experience for those people. Yeah, I think it's vital for anybody in HR or in a higher rank capacity <laughs> just to understand like what is somebody that's worked at another company dealing with when they come here. Um, what is a kid fresh out of college that's, you know, went to a good school, but it wasn't Harvard or Yale, what is he going to be going through? And just to know the di dynamics of that, just to understand, because I mean, hiring is a big part of a business. And if you don't understand your people, LinkedIn's a great place. We've seen several bad HR leadership people that, um, they start commenting on stuff and going off the handle saying things and we're like, wait, you're a, you're an HR director. You're the one that is in charge of people. Um, We've seen that happen where people get screenshotted quickly on LinkedIn for doing something like that. But this is the platform where that should be expressed and people should learn about these things and know how to deal with all the people that come through your door, not just black people, but women, Latinx, Asian, everybody that comes through there just to understand it's a different experience. 
But um, John, we yes, could talk sir. about this for days, but I want to make sure people know to get the book. And um, yes. also just one last takeaway you want to have, because obviously the book is the first part. I'm sure you're going to have other things in the future. But what are some other yes. things you want people to take away with this book? So one thing that we're doing, there's a couple of things I'll leave and take away. Um, one thing that we're doing to bring this book to a discussion point within organizations is setting up fireside chats with the black ERGs. Right. Okay. Um, so if you have an employee resource group, a business resource group, an affinity group, um, we'd love to connect and, uh, you know, uh, provide a, uh, an advanced review copy for uh, a leader of your, uh, of your group uh, to review. And then, you know, we'll have a fireside chat and discuss some of the topics that really hit you as you read the book and provide an open space for dialogue for people to share their lived experiences as well as, uh, you know, start to to ask better questions together. Uh, so that's one. Um, and so uh, the other thing I would encourage people to do um, just from a pure educational perspective is to watch the documentary Exterminate All the Brutes, uh, mm -hmm. which some have seen my post on that, but um, I think it will give you a crash course in a four episode series of what the history of colonization has done historically, but also how it how it influences your modern day reality. Uh, mm -hmm. It is an, a game changer a documentary by Raul Peck, who did I Am Not Your Negro, uh, the James Baldwin documentary uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, and I think it will help to have a better conversation, right? To in, insert different language uh, and a different lens. Um, so in addition to reading my book, bringing that into your companies through the ERGs and having a, a fireside chat discussion, and then you know, ultimately, uh, educating yourself in one of the best places to start right now is uh, to watch Exterminate All the Brutes. Yeah, I saw you talk about that. I had to check it out. I, I was telling everybody to watch um, Two Distant Strangers to see a current um, The Black Experience of Day and Day. If you guys haven't seen that on Netflix, that definitely helps you understand the policing issue we're dealing with. But um, mm -hmm. all of this, there's just tons of information. You can't unknow this. So I think the beautiful thing about this is that once you're exposed to all this, you can get along with somebody else so much better when you understand yes. their experience. I think about women on LinkedIn have tons of issues with men trolling them and doing crazy stuff. And knowing that helps me understand better when we communicate mm -hmm. like, hey, just want to talk to you about business. I know people come at you all the time with craziness. This is all work. And just understanding that like, it's gotta be hard. I have three daughters. So I think about when you know the experience it kind of helps you get along better. And um, I appreciate you making this book to help people that are in corporate. Cause it's always been keep your personal life away from corporate life. That's been a thing. And now COVID's kind of fused those two together. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. see how it does once things open back up and people go back in the office. But at least the conversation's been had that you're a real human. You have stuff when you leave here. So I'm hopeful that the book helps people have those conversations to make it where personal life and corporate life can blend together finally. Um, anywhere else people should go to find you. We got the website down below. I'm going to do my little YouTube thing. <laughs> go yes, to the website. Plantation-theory.com. Uh, you can access the pre-orders now uh, through that website, or you can uh, go direct to uh, any retailer that sells books. Uh, but yeah, definitely check out plantation-theory.com. There's some additional content and context uh, for the book. Um, and I just want to shout out um, an amazing, brilliant national treasure that is Dr. Joy DeGru, uh, who wrote the foreword for my book. And Dr. Joy uh, wrote uh, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, which I think is one of uh, the most important uh, uh, books that you can ever read if you're trying to understand the connection between historical trauma and today's reality. So okay. I'd be remiss if I did not give her her flowers uh, and the amazing work that she's done and, and the, the honor that I had uh, to have her do the forward, so that's awesome. Oh, we had a quick question yeah. from Diana Parker. She asked you, What was the name of the ah. documentary again? Yeah, it's called Exterminate All the Brutes. It was actually uh, based on the book Exterminate All the Brutes by Sven Linquist. Um, so you can check that out as well. But it's um, it's uh, it's tough to watch, I'm gonna say that. Uh, but if you get through it, it will alter your perception and perspective of the world today. And it will even make sense, unfortunately, of the things that you see in terms of social justice or the lack thereof when it comes to police, policing, uh, politics, and so forth. So um, mm -hmm. can't stress that enough. 
But yes, yeah, the otherwise. unfortunate but good thing about history is once you see some of the trends are still happening, kind of makes you sad, but it also lets you see there's a way to deal with it, at least to be aware of what's happening. And uh, she said, Absolutely. great information. Kimberly Porter said, thank you for the amazing information and conversation. And Kristen was helping name the book again. So Kristen must have read the book and watched the documentary. <laughs> Probably <laughs> from Canada. Thank you, Kristen, for sharing that. So Thanks, folks, Kristen. please, I'm big on trying to do something. John's got the book right there. I'm going to make him go full screen real quick. Great cover. I love especially get it, get it, the fact of the person working in the fields with the city background. That's very good uh, merging of the two, two worlds. Thank you for that. Shout outs to uh, my publisher, Mind Matters Publishing, out of uh, out of Atlanta. Um, and uh, you know, I'm I'm fortunate. Renita Bryant uh, is tremendous at what she does and helping to bring uh, our stories to life. So, uh, thank you, thank you again for the uh, the platform, the opportunity, Daryl. No problem. I was I was like I get to be one of his early interviews before the book comes out. So everybody remember sure. this after June 19th when the book comes out. Remember, Business of Benefits is one of the first to have John on here. But um, right. we will also have Professionally Black later in the month. So um, the topic will be released probably next week. But please, guys, support the hashtag Professionally Black. Follow John on LinkedIn and every social he's on. You're on LinkedIn. Where else can they find you? Uh, I am most active on LinkedIn, uh, to be honest. <clears throat> uh, you can catch me on Instagram as well, Instagram1906. Uh, the same on Twitter, pretty active there as well. And uh, definitely on Clubhouse. Uh, I do run a club called Plantation Theory, the balance between freedom and uh, security. Uh, okay. And uh, we do some very uh, deep discussions where we we peel back the layers of the lived experience. Okay, and real quick, Chris, Kristen said that she didn't watch it, but I think I found the doc on Crave. I've never heard of Crave. That must be a new um, video platform. Yeah, I believe it, it released through HBO. So if I got HBO you, okay. Max or, you know, HBO, then you should be able to catch it there. Okay, perfect. Well, folks, please tag a friend that needs to watch this. Um, show it some love. Hit the replay for anybody else you know that needs to watch it and share the YouTube. Thank you for joining us on YouTube. We will catch you guys next time on Business of Benefits. Please be safe. Um, we're getting better with COVID-19, but not all the way better. So please still use common sense ideas when you're out there in public. And uh, we will see you guys next time.